Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is the third episode in our Mining Insights webinar series. During this series, we've considered a number of topics, including ESG in the mining sector, and we will be going on to look at the compliance and its importance in the mining industry, some of the challenges presented by restructurings, and looking at Chinese inbound investment into the mining sector. My name is Rachel Spate, and I'm a partner in our mining practice. I'm joined today by my colleague, Rachel O'Grady. Rachel's going to talk to us today about investment treaty protection in the new normal environment that we find ourselves in post-COVID-19 and its impact in the mining industry. You will be able to find a recording of this section on our web page, uh, which is www.mayorbrown. And if you look under Perspectives and Events, search for Mining Insights, you'll be able to find this recording and our future and past recordings. I'll now hand over to Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. So as Rachel said, today I will be talking about investment treaty protection in the new normal. And I suppose the first question to ask ourselves is, what exactly is the new normal? There is a lot happening at the moment which is having or which may have an effect on treaty disputes or potential treaty disputes in the mining sector. There is the obvious ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath, and this is what I'm going to focus on in today's presentation. But there are also the proposed revisions to the Energy Charter Treaty, which were announced last year and which are currently ongoing. Again, there's the uh, fallout of the CJEU's judgment in the ACMIA case and the recent agreement which that has led to by EU member states to terminate intra-EU BITs. And on top of all that, there's just the general new age that we live in of ever-increasing environmental awareness and the impact that this and government regulation in this respect may have on investment in the mining sector and as a potential consequence on treaty disputes in this sector. Now I only have 30 minutes today and much as I would love to talk to you about each of these points, I will run out of time if I do so. Though of course we would be more than happy to run further presentations on any of these aspects if you would like us to and if that is the case then please do get in touch. But for today, I'm going to focus on what gave rise to the idea for this webinar, which was the impact that COVID-19 might have on treaty arbitration in the mining context. It's clear just from a cursory look at recent headlines that the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively hit the mining sector in many areas. Demand for minerals such as copper, nickel and platinum has dropped along with their prices. And these price drops have put pressure not just on mining companies, but also on governments and national economies whose GDP has felt the impact of this. That said, there has been an increased demand for some precious minerals, particularly gold, which is typical of what happens when an economy spirals downwards. In times like these, investors tend to buy and hold on to gold. And since the start of the pandemic, the demand for gold has grown, resulting in the recent price hike to nearly $19,000 per ounce. And there's even talk of the price exceeding $2,000 in the short term future. But in any case, the new normal created by the pandemic is in fact still constantly changing and holds much uncertainty as we continue to deal with its aftermath. So today I'm going to be covering these six points. First, I'm just going to set the context of the part played by mining disputes in investment arbitration. I'll then look at some of the typical substantive protections afforded to foreign investors um, before looking at the main state defenses that are available uh, for claims that investors might bring. I'll then look at 
state actions that have been taken or that might be taken in response to the COVID pandemic that might infringe these protections. And then I'll move on to looking at four controversial issues which might arise from COVID disputes, so to speak, uh, before concluding with some key considerations that businesses operating in the mining sector might want to think about in the wake of COVID. The international mining industry, as many of you will be well aware, is very broad and very complex. It's truly international in its scope, and the transactions involved in any single project, whether during prospecting and exploration, development, extraction, or closure, at each stage, the number of contracts or other agreements is very high. It's also constantly evolving. There are changing energy demands, fluctuating prices, new technologies, new laws, new environmental policies. And what also sets the sector apart from others is the inevitable high level of government involvement. Because when we deal with mining, we are obviously dealing with the natural resources of states and calling into question, therefore, national economic interests and politics. And this all unsurprisingly means that the energy industry is the single largest user of international arbitration. And in light of the high level of government involvement, investments in the mining sector especially are vulnerable to regulatory change and political risk. Because of the complexity and because of the continually evolving nature of the sector, Contractual commitments and legal certainty remain absolutely critical to mining investments, especially in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. In that context, it's not surprising that mining investment disputes are relatively common. And by an investment dispute, I mean specifically a controversy between an investor from one state, on the one hand, and a foreign government, on the other hand, relating to an investment in the host state. And there are various laws that govern the determination of these disputes, and I've dotted some of these around on this slide in the circles. But one of the most important are the bilateral and multilateral treaties that states may have entered into. And I'm going to talk a bit about these treaties now. Now, it's important to note that there are over 3,000 bilateral and multilateral treaties in force around the globe, and none of them are identical. So in each and every investment dispute, it's extremely important to look at the exact wording of the specific treaty in question. That said, there are certain protections that are common, or similar at least, uh, that can generally be found in most treaties. And the most common ones are listed here on this slide. As you can see, they include things like a state's undertaking not to expropriate a foreign investor's investment, not to discriminate against foreign investors, not to treat foreign investors or investments in an arbitrary manner, and so on. Mining disputes commonly arise out of claims by investors that states have breached the first three of the standards listed in this slide, non-expropriation, fair and equitable treatment, and stabilization clauses. So I thought I'd look at these three in slightly more detail. Obviously, we don't have time to look through all of them today. Energy disputes generally, which have involved expropriation claims, have led to some of the largest damages awards ever issued in investor state arbitration, including, in fact, the largest being the Yukos arbitration against Russia, in which the investor was awarded approximately 50 billion US dollars. Now, expropriation essentially amounts to the taking of private property by a government acting in its sovereign capacity, and it can be direct or indirect. Direct expropriations are pretty rare, but when they do happen, it's normally fairly obvious uh, 
that an expropriation has actually occurred, such as the nationalisation of a mine. And in those cases, disputes normally therefore revolve around whether or not the expropriation was lawful. Indirect expropriations are harder to establish because investors have to show that they were substantially deprived of their investment as a result of measures taken by the state. And these measures may include regulatory or fiscal acts. But in fact, in some of the cases where claimants have argued indirect expropriation on these grounds, tribunals have held that the state acts did not amount to expropriation, albeit that they did amount to other treaty breaches. So the threshold to establish expropriation is high. Now, states do have the right to expropriate, but this is subject to certain conditions. The expropriation must be for a public purpose, it must be non-discriminatory, and importantly for investors, it must be accompanied by appropriate or fair compensation. And the fulfilment or unfulfilment of these conditions determine whether the expropriation has been undertaken lawfully or unlawfully. And that distinction in turn impacts the standard by which damages are then assessed. The Fair and Equitable Treatment, or FET, standard is often pleaded in conjunction with expropriation claims in mining disputes. It, it presents a lower threshold, so whereas an investor may fail to establish expropriation, it may still be able to establish that the FET standard has been breached. And the standard has been pretty widely defined it basically requires states to, as the standard says, act fairly and equitably, um, including acting transparently and proportionately. And I've just highlighted a couple of mining cases here in which tribunals have found that the FET standard was breached. One involved copper and gold mines in Venezuela, the other a quarry and marine terminal in Canada. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through them in detail now, but they're just good examples of where the FET standard has been breached um, in cases within the mining sector. Stabilization clauses manage the risk for foreign companies in the mining sector that a host state will render a project economically non-viable by changing its laws and regulations. Common examples might include increases in royalties and taxes or changes to labour and environmental regulations. And the way that stabilisation clauses manage the risk of legislative change is by freezing the law. There are two main types. Um, there are fiscal stabilisation clauses, which relate to government revenue, and there are legislative ones, which are fairly broad in scope and might relate to mining laws or labour laws, environmental laws, or, or all of them. Certain defences are available to states if and when a treaty breach is established. And those defences may be found in the relevant treaty itself or in customary international law via the ICC Articles on State Responsibility. Defences in treaties are generally pretty rare, especially in early treaties, and there are very few general exceptions. That said, more recently negotiated treaties have started to include carve-outs or defences for measures taken by states in relation to public health. So these may uh, be relevant in the coronavirus context, but these are very narrowly worded and not yet that widespread. I've put a couple of examples on this slide where these new kind of clauses can be found, such as in the Canada-EU Trade Agreement, or CETA, and the China-Australia Fair Trade Agreement. So states' main defences are therefore found in customary international law. And given the high threshold of these defences, 
they have rarely been invoked, so there's not actually much case law examining their scope. It's going to be very interesting to see if and how they are now used by states in the context of COVID-19 disputes. The first offence is force majeure, which involves an unforeseen event beyond the control of the state, which makes it materially impossible in the circumstances to perform the obligation. So if used in the context of COVID-19, states will need to establish that the pandemic itself rendered performance of its obligations, i.e. the protection of foreign investments, impossible. And that is a very high threshold. The second defence is distress, which will apply if a state can establish no other reasonable way to save lives entrusted in its care. And again, this is a high threshold, though it might come into play in the context of COVID disputes. The third and final defence contained in the ILC articles, which might be relevant in the context of COVID, and I should have mentioned there are actually six defences in total in the ILC articles, but three which might be relevant um, in the coronavirus context. So the third and final defence of the defences that we will look at is the state of necessity, which excuses the state for a measure if it was the only way for the state to safeguard an essential interest against a grave and imminent peril. And this is probably the most relevant defence in the context of COVID disputes, but there are various controversial points that are likely to arise from it. So I'm actually going to come back to it in a minute. But before I move on, I just want to highlight that all three of these defences are subject to a final overarching provision found in Article 27 of the ILC Articles, which states that these defences are without prejudice to compensation for an investor if material loss is caused, and uh, without prejudice to the fact that uh, once the uh, circumstance precluding wrongfulness, as it's put, no longer exists, then the state must revert to compliance with the obligation in question. So having looked at the protections available to mining investors, as well as the defences available to states with mineable resources, we'll now look at what kind of measures states may have taken in the wake of COVID that might trigger investment disputes based on these principles. In addition to widespread lockdowns, um, measures taken by states have included the suspension of contractual rights, the nationalizations of private properties, the closure of borders, travel restrictions, bailouts, and so on. And we should bear in mind that in relation to the mining sector, pressure on state mining agencies will have inevitably increased in the wake of COVID, given their role as contributors to national budgets and government's needs. And they may come under pressure to reconsider their collaboration with international mining companies or to even renegotiate their agreements with them. And if so, they must be careful to do so without breaching their treaty obligations. Generally speaking, there seem to be two categories of measures taken by states so far in response to COVID, those to protect public health and safety and those to protect a state's economy. And many of these measures will be wholly applaudable and uncontroversial. And indeed, as you can see on the slide, there have been positive measures uh, taken within the mining sector by governments. For example, in Greenland, there's been an adjustment of the minimum exploration obligations for the entire year for all mineral exploration licenses in the country. In South and Western Australia, measures have been taken to relieve expenditure and work obligations imposed by mining exploration licenses. However, other measures taken by states in relation or in response to the COVID-19 pandemic may lead to breaches of states' international obligations under treaties or international law. <laughs> 
And these might include acts like uh, the support or benefit for domestic companies, but not foreign investors. That might give rise to claims for breach of national treatment. Uh, they may include things like measures to assist with sustaining liquidity, such as tax discounts or cash injections, but to some businesses only, or even to some mining sectors only. So, for example, with respect to copper or nickel or platinum mining operations, but not to gold mining operations. And that might give rise to discrimination claims. Other measures might be more obvious such as unilateral changes to mining concessions, which might lead to FET and expropriation claims, or so-called emergency changes to tax or other fiscal frameworks affecting mining investments. In the wake of COVID, the balance between states' interests and their response to the pandemic on the one hand, with investors' interests and their rights under treaties on the other hand, will likely lead to treaty disputes and will inevitably raise controversial issues that will need to be addressed. And I'm just going to highlight four of these pressure points, so to speak. The first of these controversial issues is proportionality. This arises in the context of the FET and non-arbitrariness treaty protections, which we looked at earlier. And it's a test often applied by arbitral tribunals to determine if a measure taken by a state is reasonable or if it violates an investment treaty. Now, in the context of the coronavirus, there's unlikely to be an argument over whether steps needed to be taken, but the question will be, did they go too far? And it will be very important to look at how the proportionality standard is judged. It must be considered in the context of the information that the government had at the time it took its decision. So it's going to be very important for tribunals in investment disputes to place themselves in that context. As news of the coronavirus pandemic was breaking, governments had very, very limited information and they were under extremely high amounts of pressure to take quick decisions and so on. The test will also be complicated by the fact that different countries adopted different lockdown approaches. So, for example, New Zealand shut down very quickly, uh, whereas Sweden remained open for a long time. And again, others adopted strategies uh, to test as many cases as possible. So it will be very difficult uh, to determine what was or was not proportionate. And uh, it will be interesting to see how this standard is applied. Needless to say, it is very likely to give rise to controversy. The second controversial issue is a state's right to regulate. And this is a customary international law doctrine which protects the state's bona fide right to regulate. So to pass new legislation or to use existing legislation in a new way for matters including the maintenance of public health. What does this mean? Well, it does not give a state carte blanche to do anything it wants but it does serve as an additional defense to the three that we've looked at already, force majeure, distress, and necessity. If it can be established, it may provide a defense to what would otherwise be a treaty breach, and it may not even give rise to compensation, even when a state act has caused economic damage to an investor. So the controversial question will be, when does government action cross the line? Because this test is not codified anywhere, unlike the other defences, which are in the ILC articles. This just exists as a customary international law principle. So it's a very difficult area in any event, and the pandemic is likely to bring it now into very sharp focus. There are bodies like the CCSI 
uh, that are very vocal about protecting this right to regulate. In the wake of COVID, they have even published an open letter, which I've, I've highlighted in this box at the bottom of this slide. And that open letter calls for a moratorium on treaty claims by private corporations against governments during the coronavirus pandemic, as well as a permanent ban on claims related to government measures in response to the crisis. And the reasoning behind this is to enable states to focus resources on dealing with the pandemic rather than defending treaty claims by investors, perhaps opportunistic investors. But it could also be argued on the flip side that treaty protections exist to safeguard investors from governmental abuses. And those abuses can occur even in times of crisis. Governments might even sometimes use the cover of a crisis to take actions that they would not otherwise normally take. So needless to say, this again is an area which is likely to be controversial. The third controversial issue is the fact that different treaties will likely give rise to different results. And this has actually been a criticism of investor state dispute settlement for quite some time now. But it essentially means that given the number of different treaties in play uh, pursuant to which investment disputes might be brought, tribunals may decide different cases in different ways. Um, and that will inevitably lead to inconsistent decisions. So, for example, a tribunal may decide uh, that a state's right to regulate is broader under some treaties than others. So, again, another controversial issue. The fourth and final controversial issue which I'm going to look at is the scope of the necessity defence. Now, this was a third of the three defences that I mentioned before, and I said that I would come back to it because it's probably the one that is most likely to be used by states in response to COVID disputes, so to speak. By way of reminder, a state may be excused from an act if it was the only way to safeguard an essential interest against a grave and imminent peril, and the state has not contributed to the situation of necessity. Now, given the scale of the pandemic and the advisory statements issued by the World Health Organization, it is likely that a tribunal would consider the COVID uh, a grave and imminent peril. It's also likely that public health is going to qualify as an essential interest that must be safeguarded. But whether or not the measure in question was the only way for a state to act is going to be the subject of much debate. And whether or not a state has contributed to the state of necessity is also likely going to become a controversial question. So, for example, uh, Brazil, which failed to respond to the pandemic for a significant time, might be precluded from relying on this defence. Given the defence is limited in time, as the offending action has to stop once the necessity passes, it's also likely going to give rise to controversy as it will be very difficult to determine the end point in a COVID-19 context. Everything will ultimately turn on an assessment of the measures adopted by reference to the information available at the time and depending on the specific wording of the treaty. But again, this is likely to be a source of controversy. I just thought I would conclude now by looking at some key considerations for businesses operating in the mining sector in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic and in light of the uh, issues which we've discussed today. For those of you with current or ongoing projects, if a dispute is already contemplated, and I hope that's not the case, but if it is, it will be very important to check the protections which you might currently benefit from under treaties and under international law. It will also be very important, given the very fast-paced uh, nature of the changes um, in the coronavirus context, to maintain contemporaneous records of any governmental measures 
which impact upon an investment or project, and any communications with the government in relation to a specific action that a state has taken um, which might impact an investment. If no dispute is contemplated, then, and I hope that's the case, then it's still very important to check the protections from which you currently benefit. And if these are not adequate, you should consider how you might be able to avail yourself of others. That might include restructuring your investment or even just seeking specific assurances from a state. For future projects, it'll be more important now than it ever has been to structure investments to take advantage of treaty protections. Um, everybody thinks about tax structuring, but it's much less common to think about structuring investments to take advantage of treaty protections. You might also want to, for example, identify treaties with stabilization clauses um, and see if you might be able to benefit from those, or seek specific contractual guarantees, which are obviously much more certain from uh, states in the state in question with whom you're dealing. So that concludes my presentation. I hope I've given you some food for thought, and I'm going to hand back over now to Rachel. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was a fantastic presentation and really interesting and relevant for the mining sector. Mayor Brown has been involved in the mining industry for decades now, um, and we will be presenting a number of additional webinar sessions in the coming weeks. We're going to be looking at topics such as compliance and its importance in the mining industry, re restructuring and how this impacts the mining sector, and also considering Chinese inbound investment. We'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback on these sessions or if there are some other topics that you think would be interesting for us to cover. Thank you very much for listening to us.